Hello everyone, this is the first in a series of lectures covering chapter 18. Today we'll be talking about section 18.1, wave interference. So in the real world, we have physical objects that occupy their own little space. If we have two bumper carts going against one another, then they will simply collide and bump away from each other. They can't, you know, share the same space, right? Waves, however, can. If you look at the ripples here on the lower right, these ripples actually, you know, could be occurring from rain. And as these ripples kind of move outwards from their origin, they pass the other ripples and for a while, there's some, some interference happening, but then the ripples keep moving. So this is something that waves can do. They can share location and they can overlap. And when we talk about waves overlapping like the ripples, we are talking about the concept of inter interference, where it's simply when you have two different waves arriving at the same region in space, so at the same point in the medium, and in doing so, they produce a resulting wave temporarily before both waves keep moving their own way. So here you see each each sort of part of the graph from top to bottom shows a progression of time where you have two pulses moving opposite ways. And unlike bumper cards, these pulses actually overlap and create a pulse that's double their height, double their amplitude, and then split off, continuing the travels as if nothing happened. There's a very important notion about waves overlapping, which is the superposition principle. Basically, uh, the superposition principle states how waves can overlap, and that is, if they're in the same medium, the resulting value of the wave function at any point where they're both present is simply the sum of the wave functions at that point in the medium. In other words, you can add wave functions linearly to obtain the resultant wave from their interference, from their overlapping. Now, this is not something that any wave can obey. Those that obey the superposition principle, those that can be added linearly to describe the new wave function are called linear waves. And generally, in the case of sound waves or waves on a string or mechanical waves, the Mechanical waves that we say are linear at the basis of proposition principle are those that amplitudes are much smaller on their wavelengths. So it's just saying that the the heights of their peaks is still shorter than how long the distance between the crests is. Now the, the waves that are not obeying this principle are called long linear waves, and these are when the waves have really, really tall peaks. And as such, their superposition isn't a simple linear sum. And this is very useful for us to talk about superposition of waves, um, at least in a situation of linear waves, since they await the principle, since after all, real life waves, you know, they can't be expressed as a one simple sine function. They're always some sort of combination of traveling waves. So with the superposition principle, we can begin to have a deeper description of waves by combining simple ones. So, in the example that shown you before, like the ripples, you see how multiple pulses can overlap. And in the moment where they pass each other, the amplitude in this case, because both of them have positive amplitudes align. And for a brief moment, then you have this interference pulse. It's taller than any of the individual ones. And then they pass by through each other as if nothing had happened. So when the pulses are both um, in the same direction, so both pulses are displacing the medium upwards in this case, uh, they overlap and they create constructive interference, you know, creating a bigger pulse. But you can also have uh, two pulses that are out of phase, like this one here, that one is displacing the medium downwards. So again, 
by the superposition principle, their overlap will just be the sum of their wave functions, which means that when they're fully eclipsing one another, you're going to have the amplitude of one subtracted from the amplitude of the other, since one is displacing down, the other is displacing up. And what you'll get is a pulse that's much shorter than any of them in amplitude. But like always, they'll just keep moving past each other. So that um, previous slide here is what's referred to as destructive interference, where the pulses are out of phase and such. Their overall constructed wave has a much shorter amplitude than any of its constituents. In this GIF here, we show constructive interference, two pulses displacing the medium up, passing to each other, and then keep moving away. The next one is showing start the interference, two pulses out of phase. And you see briefly for a short moment, the whole hose goes flat. It's almost as if the two pulses are switching spots, which essentially they are since they're moving past each other. So this quick quiz here talks about two pulses moving in opposite directions and one has positive displacement of the elements and the other has negative displacement. So what can we say about these two pulses when they completely overlap? So what this is describing is actually the previous GIF. You have um, two pulses moving into each other and we are asking what happens just the moment they overlap. And you, you, you see it here, right? In their full overlap, they actually make the medium go completely flat for a split second before they keep going both ways. So A says that the energy associated with pulses has disappeared, which is not true since the pulses do keep moving. B says that the strings are moving, that's not true. So the um, it's true that for a moment the medium, the displacement of the medium is zero, it's a flat line, but that doesn't mean that the string's not moving since the waves are still moving through the pulses are still going in the original directions. And D says that the pulses of vanish will not reappear. We know that's not true since pulses keep moving. So it will be answer C. And here again, is another description of the interference in a sort of step-by-step -step manner. You have two pulses out of phase, like the question says, and they're in interference, you know, they flatten each other out and then they keep passing by. So the answer is C. So we're going to apply the superposition principle to the basic sinusoidal waves we've been discussing for transverse waves on strings or you know linear mediums. So suppose we have two waves and they both have the same amplitude, wavelength, and frequency. The only difference is a phase factor phi. So for the wave function, then they have the same wave number, same angular frequency. It's just that one of them is shifted by some phase, by some amount. So graphically, right, they have the same amplitude. They have the same wavelength and frequency. It's just that one is slightly out of phase with the other, right? So when they're in phase, the, the peaks would align. If they're completely out of phase, you know, the peaks would align with the troughs. But in this case, they're just simply shifted by some amount. This is just a general form. So if they occupy the same medium, then you will obtain a resultant wave function that's the linear sum of the two as the superposition principle states. Now, uh, the sum of the two can be simplified and you can express the resultant wave function as the one shown here in green. And what this function looks like is actually not too uh, different from the typical sine function. But note that the amplitude now of this function varies according to the phase difference between the constituents. So what this means is that the maximum amplitude that the resultant wave can achieve depends in the phase factor between the two waves that created it. And when you have these two waves occupying the same medium like that, you don't see, right? You don't see either the blue one or the red one. You just see their their superposition, right? This this wave here that's a result of the two overlapping. So 
when you have a resultant wave like this from two, two sine waves with, again, same wavelength, same frequency, but they have a phase shift, then you can have constructive interference as long as both those waves have their peaks aligned. And that can happen as long as the phase shift is, you know, either zero degrees or, you know, 360 degrees or so on, right? Like a full cycle. So in radiance, it will be a phase shift of zero to pi, four pi, and so on. And in that case, then you will obtain the maximum amplitude possible for this resultant wave since the term at the front is 2a cos phi over 2. So with the uh, phase shift of 2 pi, 4 pi, and so on, this cos term here will become 1, giving you an amplitude of 2a. Now, in the graph here, uh, the resultant wave is shown in red, and the y1 and y2 are actually here. They're overlapping since right the, the phase that they have is zero. So right on top of each other, everything's the same. So together they make a double, sort of like a double wave y with twice their amplitude. Now, if the constituent waves y1 and y2 are perfectly out of phase such that the peaks of y1 overlap with the troughs of y2, then the resulting wave will be flat since, and now the amplitudes will be subtracting. The case where y1 and y2 have the same amplitude then will mean that when they're out of phase, this, the resulting wave is completely fat, flat, right? Because look at y1 and y2 here. y2 is exactly 180 degrees out of phase. That means that when you add the two wave functions together, all the peaks here cancel out with the troughs of y2, peaks of y2 cancel out with troughs of y1, creating a flat wave throughout. So because the um, the, the, the factor that kind of regulates what the possible resultant amplitude is, it is cos phi over two here, Right, that means that for any phase shift that makes this whole term go to zero, that's going to make the amplitude also be zero, right? Because this term here is right next to right next to the amplitude. So wherever this cos function zero, right, that's when we get destructive interference. That's when the wave becomes flat because the components are the phase. So in this case, the the phase shift that would make that destructive interference would be. 180 degrees or any odd multiple of that. So to summarize then, constructive interference happens when there's a phase shift that's an even multiple of pi, right? So that's when either they're right on top of each other, a phase shift of zero or, you know, like two pi, which is, you know, 360 degrees. So whenever the two waves are right, right aligned on top of each other, then that's going to give you the maximum amplitude possible for the resultant wave. But for destructive interference, when the phase shift makes it so they're completely out of phase, 180 degrees apart, then it gives you destructive interference and you get the flattest wave possible. But obviously, though, right, the uh, waves can be phase shifted by some other factor. And so that will make the net amplitude uh, either smaller or bigger, depending on how close that is to either zero or 180 degrees. So in the, in the drawing here, Y1 and Y2 are the blue and green curves respectively, and they are shifted only by 60 degrees. So in this case, um, the, the peaks and the troughs are not really aligned uh, at all with one another. So this sort of miscellaneous alignment means that the resulting wave is, you know, still taller than y1 and y2, but it's not as tall as it could possibly be when y1 and y2 are overlapping. So this is an intermediate result. Now, rather than talking about the phase difference between the two wave functions to determine if they interfere constructively or destructively. We can also talk about the 
path difference between the waves, as in how far do they travel to arrive at a point? And when they do so, you know, are they in phase? Are they out of phase? So this can be shown too for, for sound waves where they, they will also right, undergo constructive and destructive interference. They will also uh, superimpose. So consider the example here, we have a sound speaker and it sound waves get split down uh, this tube here. So some waves take a path here of some length R1 to get to the listener, to get to the receiver, and then some sound waves go through a, another path to get to the receiver. Now, the, the waves coming out from the speaker, right, are all the same wave, you know, so same wavelength, frequency, and amplitude. So the only thing that you can change here is the second path length. By lowering and raising this metal tube, you can change the distance that the waves from this tube travel to get to the receiver. And in doing so, by changing how far the waves have to travel, you're actually then changing what phase the waves arrive at. So even though two waves will be you know, emitted in phase, so you know the crests are overlapping, um, if then they go through different path lengths such that the difference between one path and the other is some multiple of their wavelength, then they will still arrive in phase because if the, the distance traveled is an amount equal to, to a wavelength, that means that the extra distance that one travels is a whole wavelength. So it's still, it's gonna be one full cycle of distance, which means it'll just be where it started and they'll be aligned. Uh, however though, You'll have destructive interference if you have these two waves, you know, being emitted in phase here, and the wave that travels through path R2, if the difference in path length between R2 and R1 is another multiple of half their wavelength, then they will arrive exactly out of phase, and that will create destructive interference at the receiver. And the, the reason why is because when the path length is a mod multiple of half a wavelength, that basically means that when the waves arrive, right, like the, the wave function between one and the other will be shifted by pi. And we know that when you're shifted by pi by 180 degrees, that's when the peaks of one aligns with the troughs of the other and as such, you have destructive interference. So any number of wavelengths as your path difference will ensure that waves being emitted in phase will arrive in phase still. But if waves, uh, if one wave travels through a path whose difference from the other wave's path is an odd multiple of half their wavelength, then they will arrive out of phase at the listener. And in the case that the, the path difference is neither, you know, a full wavelength or half a wavelength, you'll get some intermediate interference. So not like a full um, superposition, but not a full cancellation either. There's some cool uh, effects due to the way that light interferes, such as thin film interference. You may have seen this on the road sometimes uh, when there's like oily or soap, soapy substances on the ground, you kind of see this like uh, almost prismatic rainbow pattern. And the reason this happens is because as light reflects off the, the surface, the different parts of the surface are reached by light at different path lengths. So on some cases, some path lengths are just right so that some colors of light interfere constructively and some destructively, which means that there's regions right where perhaps the, the blue part of light is interfering constructively when it reflects off this part of the of the substance. But then say over here, the yellower parts are constructing while the other colors are sort of destructing. Another cool effect of the superposition principle is when you have a diffraction pattern where 
you are emitting light through two slits and you have this basically ripples of light coming from both holes and they're projecting onto the wall. So at different points along the wall, the path length between both ripples of light uh, changes. So in the middle, the, the path length between them is actually equal to one another. So they're completely in phase when they arrive in the middle. So you have this fringe of light here, but pretty close on both sides. You have spots where the path length is just right so that one arrives, uh, one has to travel basically half wavelength extra, and as such, it arrives at a phase. And so you get a dark fringe here since the waves are uh, destructively interfering. But then as you you know keep measuring the path lengths along the projecting screen here, you see that there's different points where the distance is just right for constructive or destructive interference or somewhere in between. So this example from the textbook kind of captures the idea of the path length being important. So you have two loudspeakers and they're doing with the same oscillator. You're told how far away they are um, from some horizontal distance to an observer. And the you're told basically the observer moves at a particular distance of um, 1.85 meters from the bottom loudspeaker. And when she does so, she experiences the first minimum in sound intensity. What is the frequency of the oscillator? Okay, so first of all, the fact that you're told that it's being driven by the same oscillator tells you that these two loudspeakers are emitting sound waves in phase, which means that there, are, you know, there would be overlapping waves, but their travel path is a bit different, though, because uh, if you notice, this, this speaker is actually a bit closer to the person here, to the receiver. And this speaker and the other speaker has to travel a further distance. The fact, though, that she experiences the first minimum, minimum sound intensity means that these two uh, speakers are creating destructive interference at point P. That means then that even though the waves are being produced in phase, here they're arriving out of phase. That means then that one one of these two waves must have traveled enough distance that the path difference is equal to half a wavelength, right? Because if the path difference is half a wavelength, that means that when both waves arrive at the speaker, one of them will be half a wavelength uh, shifted. So that's the same as a shift of 180 degrees. That means that they'll be out of phase and deconstruct. So the path difference then for the first minimum would be exactly when the path difference is just enough to equal one half wavelength. And some Pythagoras take, tells you what the paths that each sound wave travels is. So you found that R2 has to travel like an extra 13 uh, meters, sorry, uh, 13 centimeters. And because that, that's what. That's the reason why we have this destructive interference. Then that means that this path difference of 13 centimeters must be half a wavelength. And so a full wavelength then must be twice as that. And then it's 26 centimeters. And we're actually going to frequency of the oscillator. And we do know the speed because it's just sound, right? It's 343 meters per second in air. So we can find the frequency using that. And what happens if the speakers were connected out of phase? So if the speakers are connected out of phase, that means that uh, from, from here and here, right, th this wave here comes out out of phase from the one on, on the bottom by 180 degrees. However, uh, once they reach point P, the wave uh, taking path two has traveled an extra half wavelength, which actually makes them arrive in phase. That extra 
path that it covers is enough to put it back into alignment with the first wave. As, and as such, um, since they're in phase, then the superimposed wave is the loudest wave they can create since they're perfectly in phase. And so they create a sound wave of maximum intensity at that point. And that's it for section 18.1. Hope you join me next time.